Have you ever wondered whether you've picked the right team? Uh, In my first year of uni, I had the bright idea of joining the first year rugby team. I can't go into all the stupid, we'll call them thoughts, that's probably a bit generous, isn't it, that led me there, but our team had no chance. Uh, It was the competition between the residential colleges at uni. All the other colleges were full of private school boys who'd been in the first 15. On our team, there was one fella who'd ever played union before. Uh, You can guess how desperate they were because they let me onto the team. Uh, in the whole season, we were we were lucky to score a try. In fact, our goal was to finish the game without calling an ambulance. Uh, have you ever wondered if you've chosen the wrong team with Jesus? Has life been hard following Jesus? Uh, and you wonder whether you've chosen the wrong team. One of the big plot lines in the Bible is the spiritual battle. The continual rage of God's enemies out to destroy the kingdom of heaven. It goes back to the garden where the serpent tempts the woman. Uh, In God's punishment, the war is summed up. God says to the the serpent, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Uh, This threat of bitten heels and crushed heads continues through the Bible. Uh, From the perspective of the Bible, it's not quite right to say it's a a war or battle because that would make it sound like it could go either way. From God's perspective, there's no risk of defeat. But still, part of the story of the Bible includes the enemies of God striking heels, kicking and screaming against the purposes of God. And that includes the story of Jesus' life. And where we're picking up the story, uh, Joseph, Mary and Jesus have been living in Bethlehem. Uh, we know from Luke's Gospel, Bethlehem isn't their hometown. Before Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. The census took them to Bethlehem, which is where the Magi, the visiting foreign dignities, find Jesus. We're not told why the family settled in Bethlehem. Maybe there was work for Joseph. Uh, Maybe the shame around Mary's surprise pregnancy made them hesitant to return to Nazareth. Maybe it's because of the prophecy. Micah 5.2, the Christ should come from Bethlehem. For whatever reason, Jesus' family are still in Bethlehem. They're visited by foreign dignitaries who pay tribute and homage to the child, the one they recognise as God's promised king. If you look back in your Bible, so this is why it's good to have your Bible open, have a look back to verse 8, Matthew 2.8. Herod asks the Magi to return, after they visit Jesus, to return and let him know where to find the child. But... Verse 12, the Magi don't do this. An angel tells them to avoid Herod and slip home quietly. And now we're told why. We might expect someone like Herod, someone who converted to Judaism, who financed the completion of an astounding temple to the God of Israel, someone who wanted to be known as the king of the Jews, we might expect him to be to be overjoyed that God is keeping his promises. But in reality, Herod behaves like human kings. He behaves like powerful people always do. He's another in the long line of God's enemies. He sees Jesus as a threat. And so God sends an angel to ensure Jesus remains safe. So read with me from verse 13, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. When they are gone... An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt... I called my son. One of the points of 
Matthew's genealogy, Matthew chapter 1, is Jesus is the promised son of David. When you read what's, what's happening here, that Jesus had to flee the country to be kept safe from a furious king, it reminds us of David's story, running from Saul, even hiding in foreign lands. In those moments, even though Saul is, is king of Israel, as he attacks David, he's taking the place of the serpent. In Jesus fleeing to Egypt, we're reminded of other battles in this war, especially a moment reflected by the prophet Hosea. Look again at verse 14. Jesus seeking refuge in Egypt and then returning fulfills a prophecy out of Egypt I called my son. Now, this is a bit tricky. In fact, all the ways Matthew talks about prophecy in this passage are difficult if we've got a narrow view of prophecy. Uh, Many people think prophecy means prediction, and sometimes it does. Think about um, uh, Micah 5.2, straightforward prediction. The Christ is going to be born in Bethlehem. But Most prophecy, most biblical prophecy is not like this. Most biblical prophecy is not prediction. But the whole Bible is about Jesus. And so Matthew shows there's a way Jesus can fulfill prophecy even though that prophecy was not a prediction in the first place. So the prophecy here, out of Egypt I called my son, in the context of Hosea 11 is not a prediction. What Hosea is doing, Hosea 11, is retelling the story of God's people, reminding God's people of his love for them and encouraging them that no matter how bad things get, God won't forget his loving covenant promises. He's just telling the story of Israel. So what does Matthew mean when he says Jesus fulfills this prophecy? Well, Jesus is filling up the prophecy. And the story of Israel, he's filling it up with full meaning. Just as Israel fled famine, seeking refuge in Egypt, and then was rescued from slavery, and and Israel was saved from the baby boy killing Pharaoh, and I, I think it's no coincidence, Pharaohs wore the sign of the serpent, Jesus is reenacting, he's fulfilling Israel's story in his own life. And this is how biblical prophecy mainly works. Sometimes it's a one-for-one prediction fulfillment, but more often prophecy is God speaking to his people in the past and it points to Jesus as Jesus fills up the meaning in his own life because Jesus is true Israel. All of God's plans and purposes and promises center on Jesus. Jesus fulfills Israel. Just as Israel spent years as foreigners in a foreign land, so did Jesus. As God's restoration of Israel from Egypt shows his covenant love, even more so with Jesus. This event in Jesus' life is part of the reason why historically... Christians have shown hospitality to strangers. We've welcomed those who are homeless. We've welcomed refugees because Jesus was a refugee. Jesus was homeless. And it's through this unstable childhood that the kingdom of heaven comes. The kingdom which welcomes strangers and and cares for children, unlike the kingdom of Herod. Uh, The angel was right to tell Joseph to get out of Bethlehem because once Herod realises he's been fooled, when his anxiety about an infant king overflows, he boils with murderous fury. Verse 16. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. What gets Herod angry? He's anxious because his power and position is threatened. He's been shown a fool, outwitted by the Magi, actually outwitted by God. But I reckon deeper than this, 
Herod is angry because he wants to be God. He wants to be worshipped and honoured like Jesus was. He wants to have God's power. And being frustrated and outwitted shows the truth. Herod is not God. He barely rules his own kingdom. And sadly, but not surprisingly, Herod takes out his anger on innocent bystanders. Uh, Do you see a little bit of yourself in Herod? You have a bad day at work, things don't go right, you feel foolish and shamed. So we kick the dog on the way in the front door, you shout and boss your children around whilst giving your wife the cold shoulder. Uh, Swap the genders, it might be the cat, not the dog. Uh, Herod's anger is not all that different from ours. And I think often our anger comes from the same place. We want to be God. We want everyone to bow down and honour us and do everything our way. And when it fails, let's be thankful we don't have the power Herod has to kill. A balm for our angry hearts is coming to the realisation we are not God. And we shouldn't expect to be treated like God. And you know what? That's good news. One way we know we're not God is because our anger is rarely righteous. As James says, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. But we live in a world where so many voices aim for our anger. They stir up our anger and manipulate us by going straight for the angry buttons, don't they? We saw it this week with the the blow-up as Woolies and Audi announced they're not going to sell thongs and inflatable toys emblazoned with the flag. One part of the media jumped straight onto it. Be outraged! Politicians got onto it. Boycott Woolies and, and anyone who doesn't share your anger. And then the other side of the media and politics did the, the same thing. Be outraged at the outrage. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Just be thankful few of us have the power of Herod. Herod killing all the baby boys in Bethlehem, reenacting Pharaoh's killing of the Israelite boys in Egypt, raises a couple of questions. The first is, did it really happen? Matthew's Gospel is the only record. You might think there'd be other evidence for a massacre like this. But this isn't every child in Judea. It's only the boys, two years and under, in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. Historians reckon there may have been fewer than 20 killed. A horrible evil, but not the kind of thing that makes it into the history books. Though there's nothing out of character for Herod in this massacre. I said this on Christmas Day, Herod had... Three sons assassinated because they were a threat to his rule. Uh, The historian, I didn't say this on Christmas Day, the historian Josephus also records Herod's instruction for the day that he died. He said, on the day I die, the firstborn son of every house in my kingdom must be killed. That way, on my my dying day, there's going to be crying in Israel. What a lovely bloke. Fortunately, they didn't follow through. My point Murdering 20 kids wouldn't have kept Herod up at night. The story fits history. The other question is, why? Why did God allow even these 20 innocent boys to die? Why didn't the angel tell Joseph to warn all the families? Why didn't the angel tell Joseph to gather a militia to fight tyranny? Matthew doesn't answer the question. We want there to be a nice, neat answer, don't we? Maybe they died for the greater good. Maybe all these children instantly received eternal life better than a life of suffering. Matthew doesn't give us neat answers. Instead, he shows Jesus came into a world where children are killed and where they continue to be killed to protect the power of tyrants, to quote theologian Stanley Hauerwas. Jesus came into a world where children are killed and where they continue to be killed to protect the power of tyrants. Instead of giving us a neat answer, Matthew points us to another strange and difficult prophecy. Have a listen to verse 17. 
Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Uh, These horrific words come from the prophet Jeremiah. It's another filling up prophecy. It's not a prediction. Uh, The mention of Rachel points us to Bethlehem because that's where Rachel, Jacob's second wife, was buried. In Jeremiah's original context, he's painting a picture of Rachel, a mother, a mother figure in Israel. Rachel is weeping because the nation has been ruined by the invasion of Babylon. So in this poetic picture, Rachel mourned more than 500 years before Jesus. She's doing it again as human sin rages against her descendants. It's horrific evil. The battle rages. The serpent strikes again. And I think Matthew at first just wants us to sit with that reality. After the death of Herod, uh, Joseph and the family return home from Egypt. Although Herod is gone, the threat hasn't. Herod's son, Achilles, has taken his father's throne. So instead of returning to Bethlehem, they return to where they lived before Jesus was born, uh, to the backwaters, the boondocks of Nazareth. So verse 19, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. Uh, One of the riddles Matthew solves for us is, how can Jesus of Nazareth, be the Christ. Uh, Micah 5 2 says, the Christ comes from Bethlehem. Uh, the reason he's called Jesus of Nazareth is because due to the threat of Archelaus, that's where he grew up. All right, so that's simple enough. What's this Nazarene prophecy? Uh, today we've seen two prophecies Jesus fulfilled and one of the difficult things to get our heads around is what fulfillment means. Neither prophecies were predictions. Instead, Jesus filled up the Old Testament picture. This one's even stranger. There is no verse in the Old Testament that says the Christ will be called a Nazarene. No verse that says he'll grow up in Nazareth. And I reckon Matthew knows the Old Testament better than any of us, so it can't be a mistake. Though I'd love it if Matthew explained precisely what he meant instead of just throwing it out there and letting us think it through. All right, there are two or three possible things going on. It could be that this is a pun. Uh, In Isaiah 11, the Christ is given a nickname, Branch. The Christ will shoot up from the stump of David's family tree and the Hebrew word for branch sounds a bit like Nazarene. Jesus grows up in Nazareth. It could be a pun. The branch grows up in Branchville. Uh, It could be, that's one option, it could be from another prophecy in in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, which is the the well-known passage because of Handel's Messiah, unto us a child is born. At the start of that chapter, it pictures this child as a light shining on Galilee of the nations. And as Matthew says... Nazareth is up in Galilee of the nations. So the child is born, shining a light, Galilee of the nations. Could be that. Lastly, again from Isaiah, we know the Christ will be despised. Nothing impressive about him. Isaiah 53 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we hold him in low esteem. Nazareth was despised. It's why in John's Gospel, when Nathaniel hears, Jesus of Nazareth could be God's promise when he says, Nazareth, hang on, we'll get up on the screen, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Now, I'm not sure which of these three Matthews got in his head. Maybe it's actually a bit of all of them, and that's why he's, he's vague. Uh, but we don't need to know the details. What we need to get from these events is... In Herod, 
the enemies of God are raging. This is a rage that's going to take Jesus to the cross. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, he's abandoned by most of his followers, but watching at a distance are some of the women, like Rachel, weeping, and no one can stop their tears. And I want us to finish by going back to that prophecy of of Jeremiah 31, because I think that's what ties this all together. Rachel is weeping, refusing to be comforted. Her children are no more. That's what it looks like at the cross. Joseph could not protect his son. Herod wins. It's a different Herod, but he wins, doesn't he? The serpent fatally strikes. But this is where we need to look much more carefully at, at the prophecy and how it is fulfilled. Because there's, there's some hope in Jeremiah 31. There's mourning now, weeping now, but there's hope of a new covenant and a new city. So from later in the, the same chapter, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. And it continues, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Matthew 2, Jesus comes into a world of grief to fulfill Jeremiah 31. I think it's to make a new covenant. And the cross is where that new covenant is made, a covenant where there is forgiveness. And through his death, the Spirit poured out to renew hearts. And Jesus dies, rises, and ascends to his heavenly throne. And he does this to establish a new city for his people. Once again, fulfilling Jeremiah 31. Have a listen. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt for me, holy to the Lord. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. In Jeremiah's prophecy, the city is Jerusalem, one of the many cities that that Rachel is weeping over. Like, like so many cities, Jerusalem has been uprooted and demolished again and again. But Jeremiah is looking forward to, to the new Jerusalem, the one which comes down from heaven, uh, the city where God's people will live with him forever and Rachel's tears will finally be wiped away. Uh, this is from Revelation 21. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. Matthew 2, Jesus came into a world where sometimes tears cannot be stopped. But he came that through tears there may be joy. Through death there will be resurrection. Matthew 2, Herod in his anger rages against the Lord and against his Christ. But now the battle has been won. In our world, Satan and his enemies continue to rage. They're furious, but they've been beaten. Even though it might look like weakness, on the cross, Jesus defeats the powers and principalities. And so if you're with Jesus, you're on the right team. You're in God's people. Your sins are forgiven. You'll live internally in that city. Your tears will be wiped away. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, there are times we struggle with suffering, with the fury and rage of your enemies, whether it's attacks of doubt, mockery, or temptation to not follow Jesus. Strengthen us. Give us confidence in the victory of Jesus, that through his death and resurrection, he has brought a new covenant forgiveness of sins and brought us into his new kingdom.
hold us firm in the certainty of the new city where tears will be wiped away by the hands which were pierced for our transgressions. Amen.